Hello. You can Welcome. I thank you. Again, I'm going to, you'll be well welcomed by the time I finish this sentence. Welcome, Ian, and, and to all of our other guests here today, including those of you who are watching from home. A few, a few housekeeping details first. Uh, when we get to the question and answer portion of our discussion, I will ask that you use this microphone so that those watching at home can hear your question as well. For those of you at home, you will notice a chat box next to the video if you're on a tablet or computer and not viewing full screen. If you have a question for Ian, you can type it into the chat box along with your name and I will, myself or Robbie will relay the question for you. So while we would uh, advertise this event as discussing Ian McKercher's latest book, Death by Misadventure, Ian is open to, to discussing any and all of his four books. So a little bit about Ian. He was born in London, Ontario in 1946 and has a degree in English and History from Queen's University in Kingston. He moved to Ottawa in 1969 to te teach English at Glebe Collegiate. His interest in historical fiction flows from a belief that Canada has an esteemed but largely unexplored history that is ripe for acknowledgement. With the introduction of Francis McFadden in his first book, The Underling, he gives us a taste of what it might have been like to, to create an institution such as the Bank of Canada. Quoting from one of his fans, Brian Doyle, who would have guessed that the founding of the Bank of Canada could be made so lively and exciting? He began to write The Underling in 1983 and 1984 when he was on leave to teach English in Beijing, China. However, his teaching responsibilities when he returned to Ottawa meant that he was only able to write sporadically until he retired in 2005. So The Underling was not published until 2012. Its sequel, The Incrementalist, was published in 2016. Some of us had a chance to meet, meet with Ian here in this sanctuary back in 2017 to discuss these two books. His last two books, Carbon Copy and Death by Misadventure, belong more to the mystery genre, but continue the adventures of Francis McFadden and the family of characters built up in, in the earlier novels. One of the more alert members of our book club pointed out to me that Norway had an armed forces training center in Canada during the Second World War, and that one of them, Little Norway, was officially opened by Crown Prince Olaf in May 1942. A memorial building commemorating those training centers is located in near Gravenhurst. So the history element is still prevalent in his, 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 his recent books. And with this, I think I'll turn it over to you, Ian. Well, thank you very much, Anne-Marie. And I'm going to move up to the action here, so that uh, if people want to throw things at me, it's a lot easier for them. Um, so I'm hoping that the, the microphone still works, um, but I'm going to try to set up right here, if that's OK. Is that good? Um, yeah, I, I find that um, desks are a bit of a barrier. E even a lectern is a bit of a barrier between the speaker and an audience, and, and it's a reciprocal relationship here. I mean, it's not, I don't have to carry the whole show, right? Like, I need help from, from you. And I thank you very much, Emery, for that lovely introduction about, uh, I think back to my, the good old days in London, Ontario, where I went to uh, Calvary United Church, where my parents belonged, and then as a teenager, I swept to, switched to Wesley United that had a very active young people's group. Uh, and then in Ottawa, I, I fell away from the United Church for a while, and then I, I got involved at Glebe St. James in the Glebe mm, about 30 years ago, I guess. And, uh, and as a result of that, I've, I've been here uh, for joint services and commemorative things two or three times. So I, I do like your church. It's a, it's a lot more uh, friendly to people that have uh, mobility issues than is Glebe St. James which was built in 1904, and they weren't contemplating those things at that time. First of all, let me say how much I admire book clubs. I think they're really a hallmark of an open and democratic society, that people get together voluntarily without government direction to discuss topics, books, novels, and I, I think it, it's something that makes a huge contribution to Canadian society. And you think, how many book clubs do you think there are in Russia or in China? This is not something 
the governments of both of those countries want to encourage. So while you're not here because Mr. Trudeau or Mr. Ford wants you to be here, uh, I think it's, it's really important in a democratic country that we have an opportunity for open dialogue and for respectful disagreement uh, about different topics. And I'm sure that the best meetings of your book club come when there is a vibrant disagreement and people say, well, I respectfully disagree with that point of view. And I hope that you will feel free to make comments such as that while I'm here. I, I know Canadians are, are very polite, generally speaking, not a bad characteristic, but uh, you don't have to feel that you're insulting a guest if you say, well, I hear your opinion, but I disagree. Or, well, I, again, there's a wonderful cartoon in the New Yorker one time. A mother had dragged a reluctant eight-year-old boy into an art gallery, and the mother said to the boy, could you say it doesn't speak to me rather than it sucks? <laughs> so I can appreciate that if you've read one or more of my books, maybe it didn't speak to you, or maybe part of it didn't speak to you. But as a, a developing writer, I'm always happy to hear what works with people and what doesn't work. And I, I learned a lot from having people come, come to me and talk to me about um, what they thought. And I mean, I appreciate positive comments, of course. Uh, it's, a, it's a lonely vigil when you're a writer. You're sort of stuck in a, a room with a computer working into the wee hours. And um, as I've said before, it's a little bit like firing an arrow into the dark. You don't know whether you hit the target. You don't know whether it enriched people. You don't know whether it spoke to people. And so coming to a book club and hearing it, it, it's really helpful for me and might help me in further endeavors. So, uh, again, the novels have been introduced to you generally. The underling, when I was working in China, teaching English, first of all, at the Beijing Coal Mining Management College for one year, and then at the Beijing Institute of Foreign Trade for six months, uh, I had a lot of free time because the Chinese government did not work me nearly as hard as the Ottawa Board of Education did, um, where I used to teach six classes of English a day and take home the marking from that and the lesson prep. Well, they were, they were much uh, less demanding of me in China, so I had some free time. So I started to write the underling in longhand on three ring binder paper. And my first concept of it was that uh, Francis McFadden would start to work at the bank in 1934, and then I would switch in the next chapter to when she's about to retire from the bank in 1974, and then go back and forth. I'm sure you've read books like that that switch time frames, or Helsinki, Toronto. You know, they go back, they switch uh, geographic locations, or they switch time frames. So I wrote nah, maybe four of the 1974 chapters, and then. I realized that this was a more demanding task than a novice writer should undertake. So uh, I stopped writing the 1974 uh, chapters and then carried on with the 1934 chapters. But then I had to think of, where, where am I going to end then? If I'm not going to end when Francis retires from the bank, how am I going to end this novel? So I thought, well, maybe the start of World War II would be a good place to end it. And so I changed my, my pacing to get us up to September of 1939 when the war broke out. And then I collapsed in a heap and sent the book to uh, a few publishers until I found one that would print it. General Store up in Renfrew just took it on. Um, and it got fairly good reception um, from people. I think that was surprised that I had any talent at all. Um, and so they said, of course, when's the next book coming out? After I had spent, you know, from 1983 to about 2011 writing the first book, I, I had not contemplated writing a second book. I did one book at a time. But with that encouragement, I did, I did write The Incrementalist, which picks up the action uh, in mid-September 1939 and takes the storyline forward to the fall of France 
in June 20th of 1940. Um, and then I collapsed in a pile. And uh, General Store Publishing had gone out of business by that time, but a couple of the people that worked for it had set up a smaller publishing company called uh, Burnstown Press. So the Incrementalist was published by Burnstown Press and came out in 2016, somewhere near there. And then um, Burnstown Press was so small that they didn't really, I felt, I appreciated that they published it, but they didn't do much support. They didn't, um, for example, they would not send it out to a bookstore unless the bookstore paid for it in advance. Bookstores do not do that for people like Ian McCurcher. Maybe, maybe they do it for Margaret Atwood, they don't do it for Ian McCurcher. So it, it, I, other than them sending some emails around to bookstores saying this book is available and putting the incrementalists on their website, I didn't get that much support from them. Um, understandably, they were a small organization and they weren't in the business of losing money or they'd be out of business. So the next two books I, I self-published uh, because I felt, okay, what do you need to put out a book other than a manuscript? You need an editor uh, who is wise and judicious and supportive without being uh, willing to crucify you for every mixed, missed comma. And then you need a book designer. And the book designer main job that greets you is the cover. And however, the book designer also decides um, on the width of the margins, on the spacing between lines, on the spacing between word, between letters actually. They can get that down to a science. And uh, what type of paper that book gets published on and a whole bunch of things like that. So book designer, I mean a good book designer is really an important aspect of publishing. Now, of course, when I call on these people, of course, I write a check every time to the editor, to the book designer, and then to the printer. When it's ready to go, they send it electronically to the printer, and the printer, it's like any manufactured product. It's like doorknobs. You know, you, th you, think, of, you think of writing as this beautiful, intrinsic, heart-palpitating event, um, but really, it's a manufactured product. You tell the printer, how many copies you want. And just like if you're making doorknobs, the cost of making 10 is really expensive. If you make 10,000 per unit, it's a lot cheaper. So the printer kind of wants you to print more. Um, and so you have, it's, there's a bit of a debate there as to how many boxes of books do you want in your basement that may not ever sell. Uh, so that was uh, carbon copy. And with carbon copy, I decided to change the focus a little bit with um, making it a murder mystery. Now, I don't read murder mysteries very much, but my parents did, and so maybe it's in the blood. Um, and also, I watch, I don't have a television, but I do have a monitor, and my wife and I subscribe to Amazon Prime and Netflix, and we watch a lot of, I think they're called police procedurals. Like there's a whole bunch of, there's a whole range of crime genres. But one is police procedural, usually a couple of people that work in the police station, sometimes they don't get along with each other very well, or if they get along with each other, they work for a boss who's an idiot um, and makes them do all sorts of ridiculous things. And so I watch these police procedurals. My favorite is Foil's War. I don't know if you've ever seen Foil's War, but um, Michael Kitchen is just a marvelous, uh, Chief, uh, su Chief Detective Superintendent. Uh, anyhow, uh, and the nice thing about Foyle's War is um, it sat in World War II, and he is a policeman in Hastings looking after crime, but a war is a wonderful opportunity for criminals because there's blackouts, there are mysterious things going up at the old manor house. Um, nobody can tell you what they're doing because they're working confidentially for the government. So it's great for crime. So there's this burgeoning amount of crime in Hastings that uh, Mr. Foyle has to look after. So I, uh, in carbon copy, again, I'm, I'm not going to get into all of the details in case you haven't read it yet, but essentially the premise was that um, Francis was accused of 
selling secrets to the enemy because some carbons, I don't know whether you're all old enough to remember carbon paper, but um, this is what secretaries did. <laughs> Some, ca some carbons had been obtained by the authorities and they had their initials in the bottom left-hand corner and if you have been a secretary or worked with secretaries, they always put the person who dictated the letter in capital letters, then a slash, and then in small letters, the initials of the secretary that typed it up. So they found some of these carbons and they said, those are your, those are your initials? And she said, yes. And she said, well, we're gonna, we're gonna send you to jail then for selling secrets to the enemy. Um, now, she wasn't selling secrets to the enemy, but somebody was, and so she gets involved with um, the local police sergeant, Sergeant Scobie, and a uh, gentleman, uh, Inspector Hollingsworth, or mounted police, and uh, with two different army officers in military intelligence. The first one she didn't get along with very well, the second one she got along with much better, uh, Captain Quigley. Um, and so they worked together to solve the mystery. And then my most recent book, Death and Misadventure, which came out about this time last year, um, Sergeant Scobie has a death in his hands of, uh, and this occurs in the very first page, you know what's going, what's going on here. He finds the body of a Norwegian Major General and it appears that he's been shot through the head. It, it looks like suicide but to Sergeant Scobie, it looks a little fishy. So he calls on his buddies, Francis McFadden and um, uh, Inspector Hollingsworth to come and have a look at the crime scene. And so then they get involved in trying to figure out, trying to solve that mystery. So uh, in Carbon Copy, they don't find a dead body till chapter eight. And then I thought, well, maybe I'll move that up, the pace up a little bit with uh, Death by Misadventure. And the other thing I did in Death by Misadventure, in the underling, the storyline takes place essentially over five years, from May of 1934 till September of 1939. But in Death by Misadventure, because it's a mystery, things are happening, and you can't, when you write, you can't have the dramatic music that you get you know, watch when you watch a film or a TV series. Da, da, da. So what I did there is I put the time of different events and the whole story takes place essentially in a two-week period in late uh, 1942. And uh, I moved a couple of things around there uh, in, t in time sequence. I'm a fiction writer. I can change the truth. It's wonderful. Um, the main thing was uh, Major General Carl Gustav Fletcher actually did die in Ottawa in December of 1942. Um, he actually died on the 19th of December. But in order to fit the story arc, I had a mo I, in the book, I moved it up to the 16th. I moved it up three days because I had to have these other things happen. Uh, it tied into a couple of other things that actually happened in the Ottawa area. There's a tremendous ice storm just after Christmas that paralyzed the city for about four or five days. Uh, Streetcars couldn't run because uh, they ground to a halt in the ice and snow. And then there was a very tragic train accident at uh, Arnprior, um, where a troop train ran into a passenger train and uh, lots of people died and more people were injured. Um, so I wanted to work those events into the story as well. So I, I juggled around a bit with the time frame of it. But I tried to, I put the date and the time to try to make the reader feel that things are moving quite quickly here. So, those are the four stories. And as an English teacher, when I ever brought a piece of literature to the attention of my students, my question was always, what was the intention of the author? And the smart aleck at the back of the class would say, to make money. Little did he know how little money there is in uh, writing of fiction. Like uh, Canada has almost 40 million people. I would doubt that there are 10 Canadians that earn 
a living wage, say 75,000 a year, writing fiction. So it would be easier to get on, on the Toronto Maple Leafs uh, than, than to make any money writing fiction. So usually, if somebody sits down and, and spends the time, they have to, to write a novel, they have some, something they want to share. And it's, it's usually more than just the plot line or character development. They've got other ideas. So I don't know, I could, maybe I could ask that question right now of the class. <laughs> what was the intention of the author in writing these books? Or talk about the last one if you want. Did you find anything in there? Okay, the, the uh, response here was uh, dealing with the uh, time period uh, and to make people more aware of what it was like to live in the 1930s or the earlier war years. Is that essentially what you said? And this is very true because I don't know whether you, I studied history in high school and university, um, which I enjoyed, but it tended to focus on what we used to call gun and trumpet history, where you had a war, you had a peace treaty, you have the next war, you have the next peace treaty. And what went on in between the wars and the peace treaty was kind of sloughed over. And I've always felt that this was sad in the study of history because lots of things went on. Now, in Canada, between the First and Second War, of course, as around the world, there is a depression, which sometimes gets covered in literature, but sometimes not. So I wanted to look into, uh, by picking you know, high school student, young girl, 17 when, when the underling starts, um, and her experiences with her friends and with her mother and, and with a new job and, a, and what, what life must have been like for her and how she helped form her ideas and, and do what she did. And also, um, again, I, I think Canadian history is underappreciated and, and undertaught, underfocused on. And I blame the Russians for this. <laughs> because in 1957, they launched the Sputnik. And everybody was agog that they could put this little satellite up in space. And suddenly everybody said, my gosh, we're way behind the Russians in science and engineering and technology and mathematics, the STEM subjects. We have to abandon everything to catch the Russians. Now, I would say that science and technology and engineering and mathematics are very important subjects. But not everybody is going to be a scientist or a doctor or an engineer. However, everybody is going to be a citizen of Canada. And I think citizens of Canada should have a much better understanding of our history and how we got to where we are today, or they will, they, there's a danger that they may take it for granted and let our whole it, Canadian institutions and Canadian de democracy slide. I'm always chagrined at the low percentage of people that actually turn out to vote at uh, city, provincial, or national elections. When, I mean, you're called upon to spend maybe half an hour, once every four years, to go and cast a ballot for a candidate or a, a party that is platform you believe in. But a lot of people don't bother. And I, I think, I, I, like I really also don't think that people should be compelled to, as they, in Australia, you get fined if you don't vote. I don't think that's a good idea. That's, that's the stick rather than the carrot. But I would, I would love to see Canadians take part in the debate on an election at any level, and then pick somebody. And if there's nobody that they like, run themselves. Go ahead, try it out. Stand for a public office and public service. I think we have a unique country. I mean, we've, we've been lucky, I think, to have gained a lot of background from the British Empire uh, and, and the British form of government, and also to be next door to the Americans. Now, there's, there's lots of things you can complain about, the British and colonial imperialism. There's lots of things you can complain about, 
the Americans, but they've helped us become who we are. And I think it, it would be very easy now to say how we are different from British, the British, and how we are different from the Americans. That would not have been so easy to say 50 years ago. But I think in order to understand that, you have to understand our history. And by history, I mean, I think that what I would call Canadian studies should be compulsory in every year in high school. It's only, it's only one compulsory course now offered at the grade nine level. And it also be, should be compulsory at every university and community college course where you have to take some Canadian studies. Now, if you're studying to become a physicist, maybe you could study, as the Canadian component, what has Canada or what have Canadians contributed to, to physics over the last 100 years? It, it, these courses don't all have to be the same. But I think we, we make a huge mistake if we, if we don't understand our past because, you know, the old saying, then you're doomed to repeat it if you don't understand it. Because as a nation, we have made mistakes as well. Um, and I don't have to list those. But I think that Canadian studies should cover not just history, but geography and politics and economics and indigenous populations and um, immigration patterns and disasters, you know, warts and all. And, that, and we should be aware of all of these things and, and say, OK, we made a mistake then. Let's not make that same mistake again. OK, so I'm interested in, in talking about um, what it was like between the guns and the trumpets in the inter interludes between those events, which normally is what are studied in history. I'm also interested in another thing that I think is very Canadian is what I would call the noble amateur. We live in an era when everybody wants certification. You want, do you have a degree? Do you have a certificate? Do, do you have a diploma in order to clean my dog you know, or mow my lawn, um, as well as perform heart surgery? But, but I think there's a tradition that we're overlooking. And a great example of that is in, in World War II, when World War II broke out in 1939, there were 12,000 men in the Canadian Armed Forces combined, Army, Navy, Air Force. By 1945, over one million men and women had served in the Canadian Forces. So we went from 12,000 to over a million. And those people were not professional soldiers. Those people did not have a long history of dad and grandpa having served in the Armed Forces. They were people that left the plow, left their factory job, left their teaching job, left their job at Woolworths, and went and signed up and helped save the world for democracy. So they were amateurs. And I think a lot, well, a lot of people, and again, if you're here at Orleans United Church, you have a professional staff, but probably a lot of the activities that keep the church going are run by volunteers who may not have much experience in uh, Bible study or uh, community outreach or any of the things that Orleans United is involved in. So, but they say, OK, well, I'll roll up my sleeves and see what I can do here. Now, you think of all of the people, I'm sure you know many, that are currently involved in supporting refugee families, perhaps from Syria, perhaps from Afghanistan, perhaps from the Ukraine, or countries around the world. And again, um, these people who, who get involved in these projects to raise the money and do all the support, they're not professionals usually in supporting refugees. They do it on their own because they think it should be done. They think it's a good thing. They think it will help others. So amateurs make a huge contribution to our society but are not heralded. The same as book clubs are not heralded. Somebody should write a book about book clubs and all they do to support democratic institutions. So I, I think that what, what I would call the, an amateur does something that comes from the Latin. I took grade 10 Latin. Um, amo samat, amama samata samat. You love it. You do it because you love it, not because somebody is paying you or making you to do it. And I think that's 
at what an amateur does. Now, a lucky professional works at something that they also love, and it comes out in the way they discharge that profession. But I, I have a great admiration for people that take on something because they love it. And I'm, I, mean, I have to say that I love Canadian history, I love reading, I love writing. And I wanted to make a little bit of a contribution to the history of Canada. And I know I've been questioned on this by people who say, well, this is fiction. How can somebody learn something by reading fiction? And I would say, well, just because something is nonfiction, it's in the nonfiction section of the library or the bookstore, doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. For example, in my research for the underling, I read three books on Prime Minister R.B. Bennett. They were skimpy at best, uh, partly because R.B. Bennett had no children, never got married, um, was a workaholic, and when he was defeated uh, by Mackenzie King in 1935, he hung around for a couple of years, gave up the leadership of the Conservative Party, moved to England, was made a nobleman, uh, and died over there in 1947, and burned a lot of his private papers. So it's a little bit hard to tell that much about R.B. Bennett. But I developed a tremendous admiration from the man from what I gleaned from these three different books. However, while the three different books overlapped, they did not tell exactly the same story of R.B. Bennett. Now, I'm not saying that they lied. What I'm saying is they made choices. They highlighted, one, one writer would highlight certain things about Mr. Bennett, another would highlight something else. And so you don't get a complete picture, completely factual picture, of Mr. Bennett by reading one book on him. So I would say nonfiction purports to be the truth, but may not be the whole truth. Just like the Bible. Just like the Bible. My writing is a lot like the Bible, I think. <laughs> you can't copyright the title of a book. So when I was, I, I spent a lot of time trying to think of the right the best topic for the book. And I remember saying to my wife, maybe I should call the first book the Bible, because it's found in hotel rooms all over the world. <laughs> they can't copyright the title. So when I write my fiction, I mean, people ask me how much of this is true. And they ask me that so much in the underling that I, I put considerable notes into the incrementalist. Uh, each chapter starts with a little quote that that is substantiated and footnoted in the back. And in the back, I also have a complete list of the characters in the book who are, f who are, who are real characters. So you're not going to find Francis McFadden in there, but you are going to find Graham Towers and uh, Lester Pearson, because they appeared in that book. Um, and so I, I tried to bring um, my benchmarks of history into the book. But, but I wasn't writing a history book. Although, you could learn a lot about the history of Canada by reading those first two books, if you, want, if you wanted to be bothered. And I hope, I hope people are bothered, and I hope people are bothered to the extent where they, they look at the book and they read it and say, what if that's true? And then, I mean, the great thing about Google now is you can Google just about everything. Although, Google makes mistakes. So, as much as they try to give you the, the real goods, they still make mistakes. So you can't believe everything you read in Google. Um, I'm going to just mention two more things, and then I, I'm going to have a drink of water, and then I'm going to stop and let you ask some questions. The first thing. There are, some, there are some problems in writing historical fiction. One is, how much history should you put in there, and how much fiction? And I felt, while I like to add history to my fiction, I did not want the history to overwhelm the stories. And particularly, I did not want to be the sage on the stage who knows all the history and is showing off how much I know and you don't know. I did not want it to read like that. So I tried to feed it in, kind of the way a, 
a well-developed sauce may have flavors in it that you can't quite identify, but it may taste really good. So I tried to feed the history in gently that way, so it was inobtrusive, but maybe stuck with you. The other thing is, the other aspect of writing history, um, in the first book, when uh, Graham Towers is chosen to be the, the, the first uh, head of the Bank of Canada, uh, the newspapers reported on this, and they said, this is a good choice. Like, nobody, nobody had picked them in a, ahead of time, but once they were picked, they said, yeah, yeah, Graham Towers, they'll do a good job. He worked, uh, he was the assistant general manager at the Royal Bank in Montreal. Uh, in a time when, like now, anybody, anybody that works at Woolworths is an assistant general manager after they've been there two weeks. But in those days, the general manager ran the organization and the assistant general manager helped him and the president and the chairman of the board, they essentially dealt with exterior things. But the manager managed the place. When the bank was set up, it was the secretary. The secretary of the bank managed the bank, where, that leaving the, the uh, Graham Towers governor and the assistant governor free to do external things. So these reports on Graham Towers in the local newspapers, I got them, the Citizen and the Journal from 1934, uh, and actually, uh, uh, but if, uh, some, one of my first readers of the book said, these quotes you have from newspapers don't sound like journalism. They don't sound real. And so I showed them that I had lifted these quotes almost verbatim from the newspapers of the day. What had changed was journalism. Journalism in 1934 was carried on essentially by amateurs, you know, who left high school at grade 10 and went to work as a copy boy and sharpened the pencils and sent, went, was sent out for coffee and gradually got to cover some article that nobody else wanted to cover, you know, a death of somebody or some minor league sports event, and gradually worked their way up in the system to be given a, a, a regular beat. So it was much more, I would call it more folksy the way newspapers were written in those days, before journalism schools came into being. Now, there's a much more highly polished, hard-hitting presentation of things than there was back then. So here's the problem for the history writer. Do you imitate the journalism of 1934 in your book that came out in 2012, or do you change it so that it looks, it reads like a 2012 newspaper article. I left it the way it was. And if you found it unsatisfactory, okay. But that's the way it was. Um, and, and again, some of the expressions I use, some of the language I use in the book, uh, I, I, I lifted from the language of the day. Another, thing, another criticism of the editor of the first book um, the governor of the bank of uh, the central bank in Poland is a, has a small role in the in the book, and I called him uh, Governor Burka. And this editor, good editor, I liked her, said Burka doesn't sound much like a Polish name. So I sent her to the the site on Google of the Polish central bank in 1939, and lo and behold. That was his name. But it doesn't sound very Polish. So you, here you have this question. Do you leave the real name? Or do you make it, if he's supposed to be a Polish big shot, do you change it so it sounds like Walensky or something that's Polish? So those are, those are the things you grapple with when you're writing historical fiction. But I mean, the grappling, it's, it's much like any, you know, like doing a crossword puzzle or doing Sudoku or doing a jigsaw puzzle. You're trying to fit the pieces together as best you can, and it's, um, it's a challenge mentally to do this, and it uh, keeps you youthful and vibrant. So uh, that's the way I write. Okay, I think I've talked enough, um, but I'm willing to take any questions from anybody. 
And please feel free, as I said earlier, that if you felt that one of these books didn't work for you, hey, mention it and we'll talk about it. Um, or if there's any, anything about the writing process you want to learn about, I'm here. I'm your, I'm your victim. Have at me. Okay, I have the microphone here. And if you want to ask a question, put your hand up and I'll bring the microphone over to you. But I did want to comment first, so I have a microphone, so it's all about me. Um, my dad was a page boy in the House of Commons from 1938 to 1940. He was 12 till he was 14. Um, and so a lot of the th things you said were reminded me of stories he told about what was going on. And my dad was a very poor kid, so having the job as a page boy was money in the bank for his family. And I just like the way you were very, I guess the word is evocative of the city at the time. I, I really like that. But you know, I get one little thing. She spent an awful lot of time at the Shadow Laurier. And listening to my dad who came home to beans on toast for supper, <laughs> I sometimes <laughs> took um, offense a bit about the wealth that had to be in there. She was there so often. Do you go there? <laughs> I, 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 I can't afford it. <laughs> on a retired teacher's salary. I, I guess I included the... Um, it, it was the high-end hotel in Ottawa at the time. Um, when, I, when Francis first went to meet Dr. Grace for lunch, I originally had him meet her, had her meet him at the Rideau Club. But then when I did my research on the Rideau Club in 1934, women were not allowed into the Rideau Club until after 7 o'clock at night. So the men went there for lunch and went there for dinner, and then when they were on to cigars and port, well then, women could come in. So I needed a place where women could come in. Also, another thing I have to tell you about the first book, uh, in the original manuscript that I submitted, it was a uh, hundred and... It was uh, 273,000 words long. And the publisher said, on the advice of the editor, well, it's too long. If I publish this, I'd have to charge $45, and nobody's going to spend $45 on a book by an author they've never heard about. So cut a quarter of it out. You know, it's like somebody saying, your child is too tall. You know, cut two feet off so he's shorter. But I did that. I cut a quarter of it out. Uh, it took me six weeks over the summer of 2011, but I did it. And I think it was better for it. But in the original, I had a lot more detail about people. Part of the detail was on Dr. Grace, who was wealthy. I mean, he, he does um, take Francis for dinner at his parents' place in Rosedale in Toronto. His father was a judge. Uh, they, were, they were quite well off. Um, and so he could eat at the, I mean, he was a bachelor. He could eat at the Chateau Laurier and the Rideau Club. Um, and actually, part I cut out, um, <laughs> he, um, he was so comfortably off that he, he, he didn't cash his government check from, from the, he worked at the Department of Finance. He just shoved it in a drawer. And for two months, he hadn't cashed his check, which of course threw off, this didn't make it in the book, but this, this threw off the accounting department because they had this on called for, I mean, essentially it's a debt that hadn't been paid because he hadn't cashed his checks. And he just forgot about them. He's a bit absent-minded. Nice character, but a bit absent-minded. So that was, so he was quite comfortable at going to the Chateau for lunch. And uh, I mean, Francis never paid uh, in the early days. Once um, in the incrementalist, she takes over this expense account from Miss Briscoe, who never spent anything. Um, so she had, it was huge expense account. So Frances uses it then, to, you know, if she has to, to take her, um, the rascals out for lunch or somebody out, if he's in uh, Death and Misadventure. Yeah, she takes uh, the secretary out for lunch at the Shadow because she's got, she's got the money. So it's, it doesn't come out of her salary. So that's, and I, I wanted to use um, a hotel that would be familiar to people. It's still there today. Actually, I tried to get the Shadow to stock my book, they weren't interested. 
it, I mean, it took me a long time to get the Bank of Canada to stock my books. It took several years. It took five or six years before I got them to agree to do that. But they did, eventually. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, on Facebook, um, you, you posted that the Death by Misadventure is based on a true story. Can you tell us anything about that true story? Well, um, Colonel Gustav Fletcher was a real person, yeah. and he really did die in Ottawa in, on December 19, 1942. Uh, he shot himself in the head. Well, he, he really did. He really did commit suicide. Mm -hmm. He was frustrated with working, uh, trying to convince the Norwegian government in exile, which had set up in London, England, that they should attack Norway and throw off the Germans, who had 300,000 men in Norway during World War II. Um, he was a military officer. He thought this was the right thing to do. Uh, he, had, he had defeated uh, General Diedel at uh, the Battle of Narvik in uh, 1940, in May, June 1940. And then he had to retreat because the British and the French that were helping him um, went to France to try to throw, stop the Germans in their invasion of France. And once they were gone, he didn't have the support. So he left. He didn't want to leave. He was ordered to leave, went to England for a while, but he, he was always talking to the, uh, the Norwegian government in exile about, you know, taking Norway back. We've got to go and attack. But you can imagine the Norwegian government in exile were paupers. They had no money. Uh, they were living on the uh, you know, hospitality of, of England. And when France was falling, Norway was not a priority. Um, for the Allied cause, and wouldn't, would never be. I mean, they never went back until the very end of the war, really. So, so, uh, and so General, Major General Fletcher was, was sent to Canada to try to build a Norwegian army in exile amongst Norwegian uh, Canadians who had come over here in the past 30 years. Many people came from, well, from other European countries as well, but there were many Norwegians and Swedes and Finns here. But they generally came here and went into farming or factory work. And they were also, they may have come over when they were 20, now they're 50. They don't want to join an army, even though they might have had strong ties to Norway. So it, this was a failure. I mean, there was, an, there was a mention, you mentioned earlier, there was an, uh, an air training place up at Dorset in Muskoka that was probably the most successful aspect of the, of the Norwegians getting ready to go back to fight in, in uh, Europe. But it was a failure. And then they asked him, they directed him in 1942 to go to the, Amer the Norwegian embassy in Washington as the military attache. Now, every country has military attaches, but normally this work is done by a colonel, a colonel on his way up to becoming a general. And this is, uh, by some, is, is deemed to be a, a plum position where they get to interact with other military attaches from other countries. But for a major general to be asked to do the job of a colonel was humiliating for him. Um, so he'd already been humiliated, he'd been ignored, his advice wasn't ignored, but had been ignored. He couldn't, he didn't have the funding to develop an army, there weren't one of the personnel here, and then they said, go to Washington to be a military attaché. So he committed suicide. Uh, but I, I changed that around a little bit. Hey, license, you have poetic license when you're a writer, you can change the truth. So I changed that around. So that was the actual, so I mentioned, that was based on, on a true story. And also, there was a tremendous ice storm that crippled the, the city between uh, Christmas and New Year's, and there was a major uh, train crash in uh, Elmont. So those things really happened. I've got the mic. <laughs> I'm gonna ask a question again. Why a female protagonist why a female protagonist? Yeah. Do you have daughters, first of all? I have no daughters, no. 
or, or no sisters either. I had a mother <laughs> whose name was Frances, as a matter of fact. And I, I dedicated the first book to my mother. Okay, female protagonists. Yeah, I was at a book uh, fair one time and uh, with the underling, and a woman stopped to, and she says, what's this all about? And I said, well, young girl, the story of her adventures working in the Bank of Canada. She said, you write it? I said, yeah. She dropped it, and she said, I don't read books written by men with female protagonists. The end. I was quite surprised by this, because often I don't even notice if I pick up a book, whether it was written by a man or a woman, or what, what nation they came from, or whether it was translated from another language or whatever, I, something I'm not aware of. So why would, I, why would I try to write about a female? I guess, again, a couple of things come here. First of all, I feel that if you want the reader to be empathetic towards the main character, they have to have some element of vulnerability. And I thought, I mean, it was a man's world back in 1934. All of the senior, I mean, government people were all men. All the senior people in business and industry were all men. Um, the, you know, the secretaries and the clerical staff were underlings. But the idea was that even as an underling, she had a tremendous amount of power because she was very competent at what she did, and she learned very quickly. And, and you know, she, she ran into situations with Huey Fu, uh, amongst others, and uh, with Mr. Sloan, that were difficult for her to deal with, but she rose above them. And my feeling is that, again, I, I like interesting characters, and while I almost never stop reading a book once I've started it, I, grind on to the end. I like characters. I, I like characters I like. So I tried to make Francis a likable character, but somebody who was vulnerable. And so you'd say, come on, Francis, you can do this. You know, you're kind of in her corner. So that's why I chose a female protagonist. Also, I, I, you know, I was a high school English teacher for a long time, and I realized girls' generalization, my view, 25 years in the English classroom, Girls mature more quickly than boys do. Uh, boys catch up eventually when they're 40 or 50. But uh, as teenagers, girl are, girls are a long ways ahead. So I wanted to credit a young girl with the uh, ability to, uh, who had grown up in a very limited environment. High school of commerce would have been very, very regimented. And her mother, her life with her mother, her mother wasn't a bad person. But she was not effusive or, or loving. I mean, she paid the bills. She was a worrier. She had a secret drinking problem. Her father had disappeared. Her sister had died of tuberculosis, Francis' sister. So I wanted her to be kind of vulnerable. And, and so you would, you would feel comfortable with her successes. That was the idea. OK? OK, here and here. So, so on that light of the female, our, our female hero, heroine, we'll say, normally when we have these discussions, our author is not here. So we could say, do you suppose the author thought? <laughs> and so my question, I guess, is, or comment would be, do you suppose the author, as he was talking about learning from history and the way history deals with certain things, and if we look at... We don't want history to repeat itself when we look at things like what happened with the Third Reich. Uh, so in light of certain things that are happening nowadays in the United States, we'll say, where, where women's rights are going backwards. And I look at Frances and what she basically had to do in, I've only read Death by Misadventure, where she went into conversations with these, you know, smart men, we'll say, or men of power, and had to pretend she was taking notes and she was the underling. Is this a way of the author suggesting that we can't step back? Women do have to continue to move forward. When I was growing up, my mother said things like, you must vote, because there was a time when women couldn't vote. So every woman must vote. And that's what I taught my daughter. Even if you just spoil your ballot, 
So do you suppose our author, should we ask the author? Do we ask ourselves? <laughs> do you suppose that's what our author wanted us to possibly consider? Well, one of the titles I was thinking of for the underling, um, before I decided on that title, <clears throat> was Songs of the Unsung. My feeling was that women in that era did a tremendous amount to promote their boss, whether he was a, a, always a man, whether he worked for the government or he worked for private industry, the, the underlings, the women, were the glue that kept the place together. And, and Frances saw that quite quickly. And she saw how, she was, she was quite aware of, of power structures. And she, she realized what she had to do to get things done. And I don't, somebody said, oh, she's a, she's a woman's liberal, she's a feminist. I, I would not have said so. I would say she, she was a problem solver. This is how I solve the problem. And she, she didn't feel humiliated. I mean, she was fortunate in the male characters, like Dr. Grace, nice guy. He never mm -hmm. bullied her. You know, he loved her. He loved what she did for him and how she made things happen. Uh, Graham Powers, the same thing. Like a, a very intelligent man, never spoke down to her treated her the same way that he spoke to the governor general or the prime minister, um, and really appreciated what she did to keep the office running. So I'm just saying, these are unsung heroines, if you will, of, Absolutely. of our country, and they deserve some recognition. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to give them some recognition through this character I invented. And, and my other point is, if you've had no daughters, and you said you didn't have sisters either? No. Is, is the first one your mother? Well, <laughs> is that picture of your mother? Like, no, no. The, the picture, <laughs> this, is, this is the same woman. All of these pictures are the same woman. Her name is uh, Bridget Hall. She is the daughter of very good friends of mine. The first picture, um, she would have been 16. And the more recent one, you know, she's, she's just about to have her second child. She's 33. Um, Does she live here in Ottawa? She lives in Ottawa, yeah. And um, when, I, when I worked with the book designer for the first picture, she, I mean, I took that picture. She had, you know, 16 years old. She had long, shoulder length hair. And so the book designer, Meg Carson, wonderful, wonderful, creative genius. She said, when's this book set? I said, 1934. So she had a big Macintosh computer. She typed in, movie stars, 1934. Boom, up came 100 pictures of movie stars in 1934. So she started to um, pull the hair design off of different movie stars. She kind of looks like a queen, a prin, a queen, Princess Elizabeth at the time with that hair. But well, actually, <laughs> it's Myrna Loy. Is that right? <laughs> but the part was on the other side. But this is what a designer can do. She switched the side of the part. She put it on Francis's head. It was, of course, a colored picture that I'd given her. Mm -hmm. She took it down to black and white and then built it back up, as you probably remember, some of the older members here, remember when um, they actually hand-painted black and white photographs? Mm -hmm. So that's, she wanted, that's what she wanted it to look like. So that was Bridget. And I just keep phoning her up every once in a while. Bridget, I need two more pictures. So we, and we moved it right along. Okay, Mike. Not really about the book, but uh, you did mention that uh, um, writers, communists. Okay, uh, I had a little trouble hearing that. The uh, <laughs> in your comments, you mentioned uh, that uh, the people who write newspaper articles their method of writing has changed quite a bit from the past to today. And uh, I'm thinking the same of politicians. And like I think back to uh, the uh, debate we had about free trade, which I think was about factual to some extent. Whereas I think of the, uh, the green campaign that Trudeau and his party is uh, proposing or promoting as more appearance than actual effort. Uh, but 
what would be the difficulties for, for an author to try and tie like a Walter Cronkite, I, I can't think of a, of a newspaper, a news person now similar to Walter Cronkite. Uh, how, is there any, what would be the difficulties of trying to identify that gap or, or comment on that gap? Well, I would, I would say that I would just write Walter the way Walter sounded. If, you know, and, and even though it's, people would say, well, this is dated, this is dated now, I say, well, that's a direct quote from Walter Conkright. That's what he sounded like when he was a journalist back in 1970. So I would, as a historical fiction writer, I would, I would go with what Walter said and let the chips fall where they may. As far as politicians go, I think in both Canada and the United States, um, politicians have a terrible job and that they have to come up with a platform that appeals to an enormous country with all sorts of different interests from Moose Jaw to Sarnia to Victoria to Halifax. And so they make 137 different promises. And maybe they keep four, which nobody remembers. But they, they remember the ones they didn't keep. So I, I think we ask a tremendous amount of our, of our political leaders. And this is another, I think, sad thing. Uh, because it's going to discourage a lot of people from going into politics when they see how, how often poorly we, we treat people in, in public service. But that's a whole other topic. I haven't written that novel yet. <laughs> so uh, did I answer your question? Uh, Somewhat. Uh, Thank you. Mm. Hi. Yeah, I've, I've read uh, The Underling and The Incrementalist a couple of years ago, and I started again knowing that you were coming again. I'm surprised at how much I'd forgotten and, and how much came back. It was very, very interesting. I also did read Death at Misadventure, so thank you. But yeah, I, when I saw the, uh, the photos, I really good credit to the, to the book designer and to the covers because that, that second one, the incrementalist, that's a Marcel haircut and, and, and the hairstyle, and that's about late 30s. And I remember an aunt of mine who at that time, in, in that time, that was the leading hairstyle to have. So it was really, just really special, the, the, the detail that you did. And um, when they had their drink of the Macallan, the Obi Joyful. Yeah. So my uncle's was Obi Joyful, Obi Jubilant. That was, <laughs> that was the drink. It was, it was just really nice, nice to come back to that. I was pleased, surprised that uh, Frances always had these wonderful men in her life, you know, the, the, uh, the superiors who were so gracious to her, lucky her. But she did have some bad experiences too, for sure. Mm -hmm. But I was interested in uh, Huey food. Was there some evidence of, uh, you know, of Chinese? Uh, sorry for my voice here. Triads or some, some, some uh, problems because it sounded as if there was quite a syndicated crime ring uh, in in Ottawa at that time. Okay, uh, Obi Joyful. First of all, this was my grandfather's expression when he would come over. He weighed about 90 pounds, and uh, he liked, uh, when he came over for a visit, he would say to my mother, Francis, how about a little Obi Joyful? Which to him was uh, gin and hot water and sugar. And because he was so slight of figure, my mother was always afraid he'd get falling down drunk on one drink. So she tried to get some food into him before she gave him some will be joyful. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's still an expression my brother well, I, and I still I don't use. know that he copyrighted it, but I, I heard it in that context yeah. before. <laughs> a little will be joyful, Francis. Yes. Um, and the second question was about... About the Chinese, because it, oh, it yeah. seemed to indicate that there were some yeah. nefarious things. Okay, there things. wasn't in Ottawa. There were not, from my, my research. And my main research book here was by Denise Chong. Do you know Denise? She's yes, written I several do. books. Yes. Well, wow, she's a wonderful writer. And she wrote a book, one of her books was on um, Chinese um, Chinatowns across Canada. And while there was a Chinese community in Ottawa, it was mostly dealing with uh, corner stores and restaurants down on Albert Street. And you remember the Golden Dragon that used to be down on Albert Street just uh, to the east of Bank? That was, the Chi that was Chinatown in the 30s. Um, my feeling, there were Chinese tongs, they called them, uh, in uh, Vancouver and in Toronto. And I think they existed much like 
the mafia did in the United States, in that the Italians felt that the white man's law wasn't going to help them. That if they went and complained to the, the police department, who in the United States, at, at the time anyways, were mostly Irish, they would be dismissed. So they set up their own kind of justice system, which was rough justice sometimes. Um, and I think that this is something that sometimes happens in minorities. I'm not, I'm not completely fluent with the Chinese tongs in, uh, in Vancouver and in Toronto, but my guess is that they felt that if they had a legal or a justice problem, they would, they would not be listened to. So if they had to solve something, they had to do it within themselves. So they set up a, a second system of justice. Um, and we would say, well, that's illegal. Well, it was illegal, but they, they felt, and rightly or wrongly, that they would not get the respect that um, a, a white person would in a time of, of racial discrimination. So that's what I, I said, that's how I set up Huey Fu, as this guy who helped you out. Was, was, I mean, he, he becomes a very good friend of Francis. And they, they do a bunch of, uh, I, actually, somebody, in the, when I wrote the first book, they like Huey Fu. I, I remember this woman saying, I really like that character. So I said, so I said okay, he's a keeper. You know, I, so I worked him through the other novels as well. And again, he's, uh, he's, he's loyal and honest. And um, as long as you, you don't try to one-up him, and Frances never did. You know, Frances, in, in the underling, when she's got to come up with that money, a uh, very short, uh, she, she misunderstood. You know, cash meant cash, not a check. So she has to scramble to solve that problem. Um, but once she does that, like he, well, I mean, he rescues her from being sexually assaulted, actually. Uh, and, and after that, they're... They, they become very close friends. Although, at her first impression is, oh my gosh, I don't want to have anything to do with Chinese again after that experience. But then they become friends. So she grows. I mean, she grows in, through these different experiences. But according to Denise Chong, anyways, there was, there was not, the Chinese community in Ottawa was small, and it was mostly limited to, uh, to corner stores and, and restaurants and laundries. Like I have a 19, I don't know whether you've ever seen a Mites directory, uh, city directory. They used to publish these every year. Um, because people often didn't have a tele telephone. So if you wanted to get in touch with somebody, you'd look them up in the Mites directory. And it was, it was a double, double entry directory. First of all, it had everybody alphabetically. Well, the male or the household leader anyways. Uh, if there was a male in the household. And then it, it did it also by streets. So if you, I used to live at 184th Avenue. I could look up, up 184th Avenue in 1938 and find out who lived there. And once I've got the name, I could then check the name and find out where that person worked in Ottawa. So I, in the 1938 Ottawa City Directory, there were 43 Chinese laundries. So, I mean, you've done laundry. It's, even with an electric washer or dryer, it isn't all that much fun. But when they used to do it by hand, you can imagine uh, how difficult it was. And it was just a job nobody else wanted to do. And that the householder, I mean, we're talking about middle class people here. Um, the middle, and I lived in one of those houses in the Glebe, three-story house. The third floor would have been for the live-in servants. They would have had, that house was built in 1912, they would have had a, a nanny, and a cook housekeeper. But the, the nanny and the cook housekeeper would not have done the laundry. They would have sent the laundry out to a Chinese laundry. So that's the way it was. Yeah, I was really impressed with your, uh, like with your research into the, like the, like, made me want to go back to the 30s and 40s and live in Ottawa at that time. Like, your knowledge of the streets and, and the 
street cars and the just the geography of Ottawa at that time was really impressive. Well, I think part of that comes from the fact that I didn't grow up in Ottawa. So I had to, uh, in order to come to a better understanding, I had to do a lot of research. And I, I got a map, actually, of the streetcar lines. And, uh, you know, Ottawa was much smaller then, of course. It, it ended at Ottawa e and the East End ended at the Rideau River, essentially. Um, and in the south, the Rideau River also at Billings Bridge, south of Billings Bridge, was not in the city of Ottawa. So the streetcar at the time, um, pretty nobody would have had to walk probably more than 500 yards to, to the streetcar line. And so people used the street, like millions. They had, they had uh, I think in 38, my directory also tells you how many people are living here. I think it was about 55,000 people. And 55,000 people took something like 4 million rides on the streetcar. Because they, I, I met a lady who grew up in, as a child in the Glebe. Her father worked downtown as a government. He took the streetcar downtown, took the streetcar home for lunch, had lunch, took the streetcar down, came home after work. And they went, every, they went everywhere by streetcar. They didn't own a car. People didn't own cars it, in the same frequency as they do today. So it was a much smaller town. Um, and also, you, you, you may have read some of these books about the Ottawa Mandarins, the senior men, in, in mostly in the government. And this would have been a very small group, like maybe 50 men essentially ran the government. They were either cabinet ministers or deputy ministers or in charge of different major departments. Maybe Yeah, maybe. But they, they um, it was a small group, and, and they would have known each other. And, and so they would meet for a drink. Or they would meet up at the Five Lakes Fishing Club, which was actually a fishing club, where they would, and, and again, in those days, women weren't allowed. Mostly they went up there to drink, I think. I don't know how much fishing went on, but they got out of town. They went up for a drink. Um, so it was, a, it was a different, I mean, there were some aspects of it that were wonderful. It was small and cozy, but it, it wasn't a woman's world, you know. Women stayed home with the kids, and... Uh, Quit, had to quit their job usually. If they weren't in the government, they had to quit their job when they got married. So this is another reason. Pe like people often say, oh, I, I wanted Frances to get married. I wanted her to meet somebody and live happily ever after. Well, she loved her job at the bank, and in order to get married, she would have had to quit her job in the bank. When the war started, they eased up on that a little bit because they, they needed more women um, to, to work in, in support roles. So they eased up on that requirement a little bit. But it was uh, just understood that any woman that got married would, of course, resign to go home and look after her husband and prepare for the little ones. So while it was beautiful in Ottawa in many ways, I think there were some aspects of it that weren't so beautiful. <laughs> no. The Bank of Canada had air conditioning. It was the first building in Ottawa that had central air conditioning. But it did not work very well. They were, they, had, they were having difficulty with it. But um, yeah, you're right. There would not have been air conditioning. Yeah, mine is more of a, a comment than a question. Um, the book I read w was The Underling. And hearing you talk today has, has put me back to the career I was in, which was similar to yours. I worked with the Ottawa Board as a teacher in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And your character in The Underling reminded me of the secretaries in the schools. I mean, if we had a problem, we went to the secretary. The secretary knew the school. They understood the, the structure of the school. That's where your questions went to. And Absolutely. Yeah, you, you saw that change over time. You saw it change through the seventies, eighties, and nineties. But reading your character, Francis McFadden, made me think of my secretaries in my schools. And hearing you talk to today, we usually write about what we know. And I'm thinking that was your position. You had a lot of those secretaries, and, 
and I could see maybe how the secretaries in some of your schools might have contributed to the character that you write that you wrote about. Yeah, I would say that the Francis character isn't based on any one person, but on a number of different secretaries that, I, including my mother, actually. My mother was a secretary in the Ontario Hospital, the old psychiatric hospital in London, Ontario, and she worked for a man who was brilliant, a brilliant psychiatrist, the head psychiatrist there, but he had no patience for people that didn't understand something quick like that. And uh, he, would, you know, he would yell at doctors who came in with some inane question. So my mother, as his secretary, when the doctors came in and said, um, I, I need to speak to, his name was Dr. Stevenson, the head of the hospital. I need to speak to Dr. Stevenson about this. If Dr. Stevenson was in a bad mood, my mother would say, why don't you just leave that on my desk? And I'll give it to him tomorrow morning when he's having his coffee. Mm -hmm. And then, i.e., it will get a much better reception then. Now, my mother would not have done this, but she could have said, go right on in. <laughs> and it will rip your head off, you know. <laughs> the secretary had a tremendous amount of power. And certainly, uh, the head secretary at Glebe Collegiate was a, uh, was a woman of grace and composure and, and tremendous skills. And uh, I used to have uh, student teachers from MacArthur come to me. And I used to give them what I called the, 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 the labors of Hercules. I gave them some little questions to come to. I mean, they also taught some classes. But I gave them this, uh, the labors of Hercules. And, and one was about the power structure in the school. And the essence of it was the most important person in the school was the head secretary. The second most important person was the building custodian. <laughs> because these people, I mean, the principal, the vice principal, the department head, really had no, uh, no impact on you as a teacher in the classroom. But the head secretary could save your bacon if you forgot to get your marks in the day they were due. Or the building uh, head custodian, if your outlet didn't work at the back of the class and you wanted to show a movie, he could solve that problem for you very quickly. Or not, if he chose. So that's where the power was. And I think, like, again, where's the power? Like Francis, these people care about power. And while well, she doesn't abuse it, you might, you might question that in Carbon Copy when she has a little run-in with this military intelligence guy. Uh, and she um, essentially sends him to the far north. Um, but other than, other than that, she does not abuse the power that she has. But she has the power. And I think in any organization, I mean, you see it in families. You know, there's a power structure. Maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not. Other questions? In the same way corporals run the military? In the same way corporals uh, yeah, run yeah. the military? Yeah, yeah. certainly in uh, Death by Misadventure. Yeah, that, that was one of the themes there. The corporals were the ones that did everything. Privates didn't know anything. Every, above the sergeants and up were all paper pushers. The corporals ran the, ran the according to the corporals, ran the army. Yes. Um, so I have sort of two questions. One is a bit of a biggie and the other one is smaller. I'll start with the biggie. Um, you have, you're obviously a history buff and your research is, is really very, very good. I'm wondering, do you ever think of what the fabric of Canadian society will be like in, say, 2050, because you know so much about the past and how it has evolved. Does that interest you at all, or do you think of it? Or? Well, if, if there was a time machine, and I had the choice between going back 100 years or going forward 100 years, I'd go back. Yeah. Because I'd like to see what it was really like. I've read about it, but I would like to see what it was really like. As far as where we're going to be in 50 or 100 years, I, I'm confident that, that we're in a good place. Things aren't perfect. You read the newspaper, you watch the news at night, there's lots of problems in the world. But I think, I think Canadians have developed... We, we, we have two benefits that the British and the Americans don't have. The British had this history of a class society where what you did for, you know, for a thousand years depended on what class you belonged to. That's changing. 
but it's a slow thing. And the Americans have this polarization between, right now, the Republicans and the Democrats, and there's no, there's no middle ground. They have, they've lost the middle ground. Whereas we, I think partly because since um, the British conquest in 1763, there were 60,000 French Canadians here, and all of the ruling class of the French Canadians went back to France. The church stayed. So the British made a deal with the Roman Catholic, French Roman Catholic Church. And they said to them, keep your land, keep your religion, keep your schools, keep the lid on things. They did that for 200 years until the quiet revolution in, in the 1960s. So, but there was a sense of compromise there. I mean, that compromise in, in 1763 did not exist in England. Like, the Catholics could not enter the professions. You know, a Catholic group could not get together in more than four people at a time. They were discriminated against. Um, they were denied access to, you know, be, being an officer in the military or be, becoming a lawyer. So in Canada, they said, okay, what are we going to do here? And they made, they made compromises. And I think Canadians are much more open. I mean, not everybody, it's a generalization, but are much more open to the idea of compromise than either the British were because of the class system or the Americans were because of the sense of polarization between the strong individual and, you know, let's do what's best for, for everybody. You know, the, the left and the right. In, the Ameri in America, if you were a leftist, you were a commie. Whereas Canadians, I mean, you can be a communist, but you can be left of center and not be a communist. You know, so, and, and people don't, I mean, in America, because they have the primary system where they choose candidates in a primary uh, election, people belong to a political party, and then they take part in these primaries. Whereas in Canada, I mean, people can belong to a political party, but most people don't. I mean, they, they may go if in the riding of Orleans, they may go to the candidates' selection for different political parties and join the membership and, and vote for a, a candidate to run. They may not even vote for that person in the election if they, if they don't want to. But I think political identity is much more fluid in Canada. You know, we, we have the same writings provincially and federally. The same writings in Ontario vote conservative, provincially, and liberal, federally. Not completely, I mean, it's not completely uh, the same, but people don't seem to mind, you know, that, in fact, I think a lot of Canadians like to have one party in power in Toronto and another party in power in Ottawa. They feel more comfortable with that. And I can remember, too, when, when uh, uh, Paul, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Dewar, uh, Marion Dewar was, was, was mayor of Ottawa, a very successful and popular mayor. I mean, she was associated with the NDP. So the same people on the same street but at NDP municipally, you know, conservative federally, and liberal, conservative provincially and liberal federally. So it doesn't, it seems to be more pragmatic and, and open to fluidity uh, than in, in the United States. So we're lucky. And I, I think that, I think that as Canadians, we've grown up with that. And whether you're overtly in favor of one thing or another, you're, you're more open to a sense of compromise. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear you, that you're optimistic about the future because there's so much negativity. Um, the, the other question with regard to Frances McFadden and in your, your latest book, she was put in to quite some quite dangerous situations, I felt, like going up to the fish, the fish club, what, sorry, whatever it was called. And, and I wondered, was that realistic? <laughs> okay. There's a concept in, in literature that was uh, first noted by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. He called it the suspension of disbelief. And when you write fiction, you're asking people to suspend disbelief. 
to pretend that this could really happen. Like if somebody's telling you the joke about three kangaroos walk into the bar and order martinis. Well, you want to hear the joke. You don't say, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> kangaroos don't walk. They don't drink alcohol. They don't have any money. You know, they can't talk. What are you trying to do? We suspend disbelief because we want to hear the joke about the three kangaroos in the bar. So what a writer wants you to do, I mean, you could say this is true for Harry Potter. You know, he goes to, what, track nine and a half in the station and, you know, the train to Hogwarts leaves from there. You, you're willing to suspend disbelief and believe that there's a wizard school because you want to get on with the story. And, uh, I mean, sometimes you stretch credibility, but I felt that, I mean, she, when she goes up to, she goes up, they're, they're trying to find the gold, or the, I guess they're trying to find the guns, is what what, and the gold, they're trying to find both. Uh, and they go up there, and they don't know who else might be up there. And I mean, she goes up with Inspector Hollingsworth. Um, so she thinks, and, and they feel they have to act quickly, so they're, they don't call in the troops. They've got to respond quickly. So sometimes, in difficult circumstances, we respond quickly, and sometimes maybe put ourselves in danger that we don't anticipate. So I don't think she anticipated running into Berg Larson up there and uh, having him want to, want to take the gold and kill them. Yeah. Thank you. I have read all four books. I love history, and of course, I love them. Good. Tell me, is there going to be another? <laughs> I, 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 I'll just tack my question on to that, is have you considered writing about any other moments in Canadian history? Okay, well we'll do this one at a time. Um, I know that, like, again, I, I'm flattered that people, when they read the first book and the second book and the third book, they said, I loved it, when's the next book coming out? <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 uh, I don't want to, I, I don't want you to feel sorry for me. But it's a lot of work writing a book. It takes a long time. Some people are better at it than others. But it, it, you know, the first book took me almost 30 years to get that written. And then the second book, four years. And then a shorter time span in, in Death and Misadventure, a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should be able to crank them out. Like, I, I do read about these writers that crank out a book every year. I'm, I'm amazed. Um, I do have. There's another book uh, in vitro, I guess. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on another book. I, I don't know um, when it will be finished, uh, but it might be finished next year. It might, but it certainly, it, it might, I, when, you do the, when you do the first draft, and the first draft really isn't the first draft, um, I keep, I keep all of my chapters in a separate file on my computer, and I keep the date that I modified each chapter in the, in the header. So I know how many times I've worked on that chapter. No. But I keep a lot of versions, because I'm afraid I'm going to lose it. I'm afraid that the version I set last week, what if something happened to my computer? So I keep a lot of versions, but I don't keep them all. And I don't print them anymore. With the first two, I used to print them off because I wanted to keep the hard copy. Now I don't. Um, so this next one goes back to the end of The Incrementalist, which ends in June 1940, when France falls. And if you've read, how many of you have read The Incrementalist? OK, well, Frances almost gets fired at the end of The Incrementalist. I don't want to spoil this for other people, but she doesn't quite get fired. But it's a very harrowing experience for her. So she goes out for dinner with Dr. Grace that weekend, and she says, I, I don't know whether I want to keep doing this. And he tries to buck her up and says, come on, you're doing a great job. You know, don't worry about this little stuff. So the next book, working title, Home and Away, my wife does not like that title, so it probably won't stay. The next book picks up the action 
the Monday, this book ends kind of on Sunday night with Dr. Grace. The next book starts Monday morning in June, in June of 1940. It'll be, I think it's the 21st. Um, and she goes back into the office and uh, has some conversations with some people um, and decides to stay. And so what I've done in the next book, Home and Away, is that I, going back to the topic of the underlane where I writ, my original draft was chapter 1934, chapter 1974, 40 years later, as she's about to retire. What I'm doing in the next book, book five, tentatively Home and Away, odd number chapters 13579, Ottawa with Francis, even number chapters 246810, with her boyfriend Paul in France. He has gone to France, as you would have noticed in the incrementalist, to do something mysterious in the war effort. She doesn't know what it is. And so I, I bring him back in, and he gets left behind when the Canadians and the British evacuate France. Uh, he, he stays uh, ostensibly to help. He's, you know, he's an engineer. They've got lots of equipment that doesn't work. He stays to help the French. But he's on, on, after two or three days, it's a capitulation. So he, um, he starts to walk down towards the Spanish border to get out of the country, but the best intentions of us all sometimes are led astray. So he ends up staying in southern France. So those chapters, the even number of chapters are Paul in France, the odd number of chapters are Francis in Canada, and then at the end of the book, they both end up they brought back together in England. He goes back to England to get some training. He's doing some sort of, you know, undercover work to help people get out of the country and things like that. Um, and she and, and um, the governor go over to England. England was really out of money. And they wanted, they wanted more resources from Canada and Australia and New Zealand. And they didn't really understand the Canadian taxation system, which originally left most of the taxing powers to the provinces. The federal government could, you know, they got money from excise taxes. They could tax things coming in. But the provinces had the right to do income tax. So the federal government couldn't just raise taxes. Now, they worked out a deal in the late 30s where they, they took over the taxing powers of the province. But the British, I mean, they didn't have provinces. They had counties, and they had a national government. They couldn't understand, but the Canadians couldn't give them more money. So they're always bickering back and forth about Canada's contribution to the war effort. So in the, no the next novel, Graham Towers goes over with Francis to help sort, of sort this problem out. So that's where Francis and, uh, and Paul get together towards the end of that book. Um, but it's, uh, as I say, it's on the blocks. I'm working on it. I, I won't get it finished before the end of the year. And once the book is finished, i.e., once I've gone through all these chapters and tied these things all together, and it's ready to be read by somebody else, I usually have five or six people read it and comment on it. And then I take that final draft and get it to the designer, and then, you know, get it to the editor, then get it to the designer, then get it to the printer. That whole process takes about another six months. So probably won't be out before this time next year. How well are your books selling? Well, they sell well in Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, again, this is what most, this is what a publisher usually does, is they look after the post-production, the distribution, and, and to, to book stores and things like that. Without a publisher, I do that all myself. So I either come to events like this to try to flog my books, or uh, I, I, for the first three books, I had, uh, I had a book launch. Because of COVID, I didn't have a book launch for the last one. So I just sent emails out to people that had purchased books before. Uh, but I'm not very well organized, so I don't think I, I got in touch with everybody that had been a fan of Francis, but I got in touch with quite a few. And um, the private bookstores in Ottawa carry them, and the library carries them, and um, Coles in Billings Bridge carries them. Um, and uh, they're all, you can get them digital, you can get them on Amazon, either a, a digital copy or a hard copy. I, I don't know how they do it, but they, you order one copy, 
of uh, the underling from Amazon, they print one copy and send it to you. So um, I would say um, of the four books together, I've probably sold a total of somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 copies. And I think that probably, well, you would know this yourself about how many copies you buy and how, who you share them with and things like that. I would think if I've sold uh, 23,000 copies, probably 10 to 15,000 people have read one of these books. That you, you know, probably four people read each, read each book. I know, I've, I've checked, you can check on the library how many people are waiting to get a, a copy of one of my books in the library. But that, so this is not huge. This is small potatoes. Anyone else? I, I think we probably have a few people here that be more than willing to be, you know, read it over your book by there, each one of them. <laughs> okay, well, I think when you... You said half a dozen people. Just put it out there. Well, when you buy... When you buy books, like, uh, don't think of yourself as, as spending money. Think of yourself as engaging in cultural philanthropy. Uh, especially for the Canadian uh, publishing industry is, is, is under, underdeveloped and undersupported. And, uh, you know, if you, whether, whether you buy a Francis book or written, something written by another Canadian author, please, please go out and do it. And uh, I know people say, well, I live in an apartment. I don't have room for books. I say, buy it, read it. Give it to somebody else. You know, pass it, pass it along. And, and, and you know, my husband, he's deceased now, but he was in the Navy, and uh, he wrote a book while he was at different ports, you know, because he was crying. He, <laughs> he wrote this book, and he always said, if I ever win a million dollars, I'm going to open a publishing company for people like me who want to get their book published and can't get a book. Well, it's very hard to get a book published in Canada. Believe me, but, but publishers are business people. They don't want to lose money on you, and there's a lot of upfront costs. You know, with with uh, editing, designing, um, distributing, printing. They don't want to take a. I don't know whether this statistic is still true, but at one time, about 20 years ago, someone told me a publisher will get 100 manuscripts. They'll select 10 to publish. They'll make enough money on two to pay for the other eight. Now, I don't know whether those statistics are still accurate, but it's something like that. Like, people don't make money publishing books. Uh, like, I'm fortunate, I suppose, in that I got a small inheritance when my father passed away, so I put it in the bank, I put $10,000 in the bank, and I said, okay, I'm going to use this $10,000 to help with my writing. And, you know, I, I've managed to keep $10,000 in the bank, even though you know, out it goes when the original and I gradually earn enough back. So I've, I've made a little bit of money over the course of 10 years. But, but not, like it's, if you try to figure out what my hourly wage is as a writer, it'd probably come out to something like 11 cents an hour. Um, but I don't, I don't care. Like again, you buy them, you're a cultural philanthropist. I think of myself as a cultural philanthropist. I don't, I'm a retired school teacher, I have a nice pension. I don't, I don't need to do this for money. I don't want to take money away from my wife and kids, so I keep it in a separate account. But they don't suffer. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, <laughs> what can I say? It's been really wonderful having you back and sharing your time with us. In appreciation, we would like to give you a little something. A book? No. <laughs> Why, thank you very much. Whoa. Look at this. Tea towels. Oh, yeah, but you might want to go a little bit further. No, no, there's no more. They are just tea o towels. Open them up? Yeah, each. Yeah. Look at that. The Bank of Canada, Francis, Bridge. Oh, alcohol. They're drinking alcohol. <laughs> and gold. Well, that's a lovely, lovely thought. Thank you very, very much. One book club I went to um, took the, I think it was the incrementalist, and had it mounted on a, on a hot pad. For, that, you know, when you're bringing that was a, us. That was you? <laughs> well, I, I still have that hot pad. Thank you. Yeah. So in closing, we're now going to adjourn to, to the library, which is the one with the glass, glass windows for in, 
anyone here who doesn't know. <laughs> and uh, Ian for coffee and treats. And Ian will be available to sign your books if you brought them, sell you one or two if you haven't, and just chat. So with that, we'll say, we'll say thank you. And thank you much to Dave for doing our uh, AV. AV, AV for us. OK, great. All right, well, I'll pick up my stuff here, and we'll head across to the library. Yeah. Now, did I answer your question? You had yes. To... Okay. 